In this hobby, we mostly focus on the computers, games, and accessories. But an often overlooked part of the hobby are the manuals, books, and magazines of the time. Let's talk about those today, why they are so important, and a very good option to preserve them. I know what a lot of you are thinking. There's no point to those physical books and magazines because they're all available digitally online. And to that I say yes and no. You could say the same thing about games. They're all available online, so why bother? And a lot of people don't, and that's fine. But a lot of us like the physical aspect of a game. We like seeing a game and feeling a game. And the box and the manual and the media is a physical reminder of the game itself beyond just the file name among other bunch of gigabytes in a hard drive. And same thing with physical books and magazines. I know I can get PDFs online of most things here, but nothing beats sitting here leafing through a physical magazine or pulling out a book and showing it to my daughter to help her with whatever program she's making at the time. But having them in digital format is also extremely handy. If they've been scanned with character recognition, you could actually search through hundreds of magazine issues to find the particular issue you're looking for. I actually do that quite a bit, even with these magazines here. I first search for them on the computer, find out the issue they're in, the article that I'm looking for, and then come here and read it. There's also the drawback of volume. What I have here is only a tiny fraction of books and magazines that I'm interested in, and it's already taken up a whole bookcase. So having a physical copy of everything I'd like to read would turn this whole room into a library, which actually sounds really cool, except that then I would have to get rid of everything else that is in this room here. So yeah, I don't think I'm doing that. And even if you have all the space in the world, there is the issue of cost. Some of the printed retro material, especially in the early years, just didn't have much of a print run and can now be extremely expensive. Even something as common as a computer shopper magazine from the late 80s or early 90s, and this was just mostly ads, can go for over $50. So no, it's not realistic to have everything in a physical format. And the great thing about it is that there are places on the internet that have most of these books and magazines all available and cataloged. You'll find a lot of them thrown around in archive.org, but my favorite ones are the ones that focus on a particular platform. The Amstrad CPC community, for example, has acpc.me, which in spite of an overly cute UI, has an amazing amount of content. There are similar sites for most other platforms like Asimov FTP for Apple II and other similar ones. And all of that is great until you realize that not everything published for retro computers is available on the internet. And that's because the material is relatively old and there's actually quite a lot that is not available, especially when you get into publications from different countries. So you can ask around in the retro forums and Discord channels to see if someone has the magazine you were looking for, or maybe you were lucky enough and you found it for sale and bought it. So what now? The next step will be to preserve it so you can have your own electronic copy and maybe also make it available to anyone else interested. The method that I used in the past was to take out a flatbed scanner like this one and start scanning. This is really cheap and it works on just about any computer. The quality is also more than good enough for any printed material, but it's slow. Like really slow. Even when you have a system down, you can probably only do a couple pages per minute and you can buy more expensive flatbed scanners and they're faster, but they're still pretty slow. Besides, one big problem with these kind of scanners is that they require you to put the material completely flat against the scanning bed. On a magazine, that's probably fine, but not so much with all books, especially cheap ones that were not bound very well to start with. If you open a book like that all the way, you'll probably break the spine. It turns out there's a new type of scanner that addresses those problems, like this Zizer one. Specifically, this is a ET24 model and it was sent to me free of charge by Zizer, but with no strings attached, so I can tell you exactly what I think about it. This type of scanner claims to be much faster and it doesn't require opening a book all the way. Is this the ideal scanner for retro material? It's really good, way better than a flatbed one, but it's not quite perfect. So let's put it through its paces, see how it works, and then talk about some of its shortcomings. Right away, this looks completely different from a traditional scanner. Instead of having a glass bed, you have an overhead camera to take the picture, so you just put the material you want to scan on the table facing up and you press the button. Wait a second. Is that any better than a picture taken with a reasonable camera? Yes, it is. The scanner will actually measure any curvature in the book with some laser beams and correct for it. I imagine it also corrects for lens distortion in the same way. Like a traditional scanner, it needs to be connected to a computer, and I'm happy that it supports Macs and Linux, and not just Windows like some devices do. 
First, let's start really easy and let's do a single page document like this reference card for a basic language. I chose this particular one because it's flat and non-reflective. All I have to do is place it on top of the scanning mat and I can see a live preview both on the computer and on the small screen on top. The screen on top of the scanner isn't really convenient if I'm sitting down, so I suspect it may be intended more for the presentation mode of this scanner, which is something that I haven't really explored. Anyway, once I have the page anywhere, I just need to press the pedal button and it scans it pretty much instantly. On the computer, I get an image that has been rotated and slightly processed for a crisp result. And most importantly, that was fast. Now let's try this Atari brochure. This one is more challenging because it's reflective. So when I put it on the scanning surface, it reflects glare back up to the camera. If I take a picture, the glare doesn't go away magically. The way the scanner deals with reflective pages like this or magazines is to use a different light mounted on the support. That light shines at an angle and it doesn't get any glare in the camera. And when I turn it on, yeah, that looks much better. And the scan is perfect. So let's try scanning a book, but one that opens flat, like this map in the Commodore one. If I just scan it like before, it'll detect both pages as a single document and combine them in an image. If I want each page to be scanned separately, I need to select the two-page mode, put the spine of the book in the center of the scan area, and scan it. Now, it detected both pages and put them separately, but the results aren't fantastic. The borders of the left page are not great, and the right page is not straight and has some weird artifacts. I suspect this is because the scanner software is looking for a normal book spine, not one with a spiral bind like this one. Interestingly, it's getting totally confused with these two pages. I don't know if it's because one of them is totally blue and then there's the spiral, but it's cutting them at weird angles. I suspect that for this kind of binding, you're better off doing it as a single page document. Now let's do another book, but one that doesn't open flat. We're going to use this Inside the Dragon one, which is a fantastic book, by the way. I'm going to open up to a page and it's pretty clearly curved, but this is where the scanner really gets to shine. I'm gonna pause it right when it does the laser scanning and yeah, there you can see the laser following the curvature of the pages. Curvature and all, the scan of the two pages is almost perfect. It's actually really cool comparing what the camera was seeing with the final scan. It clearly warped the image to appear perpendicular to the camera. Doing that will affect the final resolution of the picture, but I imagine it's a pretty high resolution camera to start with to allow for this kind of processing. So yeah, it did a fantastic job here. So what made all these books and magazines so special that we want to preserve them today? The manuals are the most obvious ones. They're kind of part of the computer itself, a bit like the original box, but a lot more useful. I'm not a box guy. But what about all the other books and magazines? There are multiple answers to that question, actually. The first one is that information about those computers in that era was precious as gold. I don't think people who grew up with the internet at their fingertips realizes what a radical change that was. Back then, for a kid growing up outside of a major city, like me, the only information about a computer was what the manual came with. Then you could find some dedicated magazines, which would be mostly filled with game reviews, but they would drip feed you some really intriguing information about hardware or programming techniques or assembly language. Things that would often cause more questions than answers, but that's not really a bad thing. There were very, very few books available to me about those computers, especially ones that would go deeper into hardware details or machine code. I actually remember very clearly how I got my first book about Z80 assembly. I saw an advertisement listed in a magazine with an order form, so I clipped out the form, filled it out, and sent it in the mail with some money. And a few weeks later, I got this book which unfortunately I don't have with me anymore. And there I was finally able to learn Z80 assembly language. In contrast today, you can search for Z80 assembly and you have more information than you could possibly read. Another anecdote that illustrates how rare and precious books and information was back then, it happened when I went on a trip to Madrid when I was 15 or 16. Anytime I would go into one of the nearby cities to where I live, I would always check out the bookstores for any books about my favorite computers. Usually that was limited to just a handful of books and most of them about really basic stuff in typing games. But this time that we went into Madrid, I decided to check out a specialized technical bookstore. If any place in Spain was going to have a good amount of obscure technical books, that was gonna be it. And the second I walked in there, I was blown away seeing these books I had never seen before. Maybe I had seen a review in a magazine or something like that, but I had never seen them in person and they were really low level and in depth books. And I can't tell you how excited I was. And I walked away with five or six books that just opened up a bunch of new horizons for me. Now let's try possibly the most difficult thing. 
a book that won't stay open. In that case, I need to hold the pages open by hand, which normally would be a problem because I'm blocking part of the page with my finger and I don't want my finger showing up in every scan, but this scanner is prepared for that. It comes with these tabs for you to hold the pages open while it scans them. The reason the tabs are like that is so that they're easy for the software to detect them and remove them from the image. So here I take a scan of the pages and yeah, they're magically removed from the scan. You can actually tell they were removed because it looks yellowish and not quite right. But I realized right after that this was because I had some ambient light on during the recording and in the manual they recommend doing it without any other light sources. So once I turned the light off, I was able to rescan it and yeah, it looks much better now where it removed the tabs. It also has a mode to detect your fingers instead of the tabs, which is probably not as accurate and it even warns you in the manual that it may have different results depending on skin color, but it's a lot more comfortable than using the tabs. This, by the way, is why the main button to start the scan is activated with a foot. That way you can have both your hands on the material you're scanning and activate it without having to move. That's very convenient. Let's try a magazine next. It's much larger than the books that we were doing before, but it fits very comfortably in the scanning area. I'm also using the backlight because it's somewhat reflective and I want to avoid the glare. And it has no problem with the thinner page or the size and it makes a great scan of both pages. And now for something probably much tougher, this computer shopper magazine. This is an example of something that isn't available on the internet, so I would love to scan that and make it available. Let's see if it's possible. Oh, I just popped the spine by trying to open it all the way. Oops. It looks like I have multiple problems here. The size of the magazine seems way too big. It hardly fits in the scanning window, let alone the recommended area the overlay indicates for the book. And if I try to take a scan, yeah, it doesn't pick up the curvature correctly and it doesn't look quite right. I could do it one page at a time, but at that point, I can't get the scanner to automatically recognize and cut a single page or even remove the curvature from the page. So I would have to manually crop and rearrange every image. And that would be very time consuming and it starts defeating the purpose of the fast scanner like this. Also, even if I managed to fit it somehow in the scanning area, I can't use the tabs very well because there are barely any margins and I'll cover some text or graphics no matter where I place them. So yeah, I'm starting to understand why there are so few computer shopper magazines scanned out there on the internet. The form factor is definitely an issue here. Another really interesting thing about the magazines of the time are the content, but not so much the contents they intended. After all, 30-year-old game reviews, which were mostly paid advertisements most of the time, aren't really all that useful today. It was the side content that is often really interesting, the advertisements in the magazine. Unlike a book, magazines are very clearly set in a particular point in time, so leafing through them in chronological order, you get to see some computers appear and disappear in advertisement pages. Seeing the prices and the evolution of those prices is really interesting. Was the computer at the top of the market? Then did it drop its price to compete with something else? We obviously know what happened at the end, but seeing that is a totally different perspective. That is one of the reasons why magazines like Computer Shopper are still interesting today. I know some people read them for the articles, but they're like 90% ads. I'm actually researching a video about Computer Shopper and how we bought computers in the early 90s that I'm hoping to have ready in a few months. Okay, so I'll try this Radio Shack catalog instead. This one was sent to me by Matt Kastorf last year. Thank you, Matt. I love these old catalogs. So many fun memories looking at these. I see there's a whole website dedicated to Radio Shack catalogs, and it actually looks awesome. But this one is a Canadian 1986 catalog, and it doesn't seem to be there or anywhere else online, so it would be great to be able to fully scan it and put it online. Let's see how it goes. I'm going to try to do it quickly. There are 183 pages, so let's see how long it takes me to do everything. I'm using just my fingers to hold the pages because it's much faster than the tabs, and the software seems to do a pretty good job removing my fingertips. While this is going on, I wanted to take a second to thank all the channel supporters on Patreon and YouTube. You know, some videos get more views than others, and sometimes it can be discouraging when a video that I had high hopes for ends up doing below average. But it always helps a huge amount to think of all the supporters that are eagerly waiting to watch new videos independently of the YouTube algorithm whims. So thank you, everybody. Anyway, back to scanning. This is going really fast. I ended up taking exactly 14 minutes, so that's 13 pages per minute or four and a half seconds per page. That's pretty good. Although that's not the whole story. I went back and looked at the scans and I found a few where it didn't remove my fingers or it did a particularly bad job cropping or adjusting curvatures, so I had to go back and rescan about a dozen pages. After that, I created a PDF and I put it on archive.org in case you wanted to check it out. The link is in the description. 
It's both a fun catalog to browse, and it can also help you see what kind of quality you can expect by doing a quick scan like this. And that's actually something really important. I strongly encourage everybody to have a look at their retro-related publications and see if they have something that is not available online. If they aren't, please take the time, scan them using whatever method you want, even if it's phone pictures, and upload them so they can be preserved. Otherwise, the material might be limited to your collection and then eventually might be discarded somewhere. So far, the Zezer scanner is quite good. Maybe not perfect, but certainly better than anything I've tried before. But let's try a few more things that a traditional scanner would not be well suited for. I'm interested to see if it could scan games with it, and by that I mean the material that came with the games. I know not everybody likes doing that, but it's another form of preservation for physical material that comes with games. Let's start with this early Amstrad game. This should be pretty easy because the case, it's like a VHS case and you can remove the insert. So that's easy to scan separately, but here we see an area where this scanner is actually worse than a flatbed scanner the insert doesn't stay flat. So the scan keeps showing up as warped, and because it's not the normal two-page curvature, it can't detect it and remove it. And I can't use my fingers because there are graphics everywhere. I suppose I could get a clear piece of plastic and put it over it and scan it, but really, for something like this, you're better off with a traditional scanner, so don't throw those away quite yet. And what about the disk? This is the first thing we're attempting to scan that is not actually paper, and yeah, it looks like you did a really good job with it. Let's try something a bit more challenging, like this big box PC game, which happens to be one of my favorites too. This time I can't just take out the insert, so let's see how it handles the box. One of the problems I expect with the scanner is that it has a fixed focal length, so the image might be out of focus because it's not flat on the scanning mat. This particular box should be extra challenging because it's very thick, unnecessarily so actually. <laughs> but it looks like it was able to scan the cover perfectly fine. Same thing with the back. Now this gets tricky. The side is so tall that standing it on end, it's below the side lights, so I need to add a light with the lamp on the desk. And when I scan it, yeah, okay, that's clearly too far and out of focus, so it won't work for that. Let's try with the contents of the box, specifically these discs. I'll put them in the scan mat and change the mode to multi-area. This is probably intended for photographs, that you put several in the mat and it detects each one separately and it creates a file for each of them. But this is funny because the discs are black and the scanner is having a hard time picking them out as you can see by the outlines. It picks up parts of the top one and nothing below. So I need to play with an external lamp and get a little bit more light there and now it seems to finally detect them all correctly. And even so it looks like it cropped some of them too aggressively. So it may be a matter of playing with the light and maybe even the background color to get that right. But again, this may be a better job for a flatbed scanner. There's one last thing that I want to try which might sound weird to some people, I want to see if I can scan a computer board with that scanner. The reason for that is that scanning a board is usually one of the best ways to preserve them. For example, on CPC Wiki, there's a whole section with every single Amstrad CPC board version known and pictures of them. The best pictures there are actually scans done with a special scanner with a large depth of field. Most bed scanners can't handle anything being more than a few millimeters away from the scanning bed, so this one should be interesting. The size of the board seems perfect for the scanner but it's also very reflective, that even the side lights are reflected into the camera. So I need to move it down a little bit and position it just right, and it seems okay. It's interesting because it feels like there isn't as much light here at the bottom of the mat than at the top. Maybe that doesn't matter for documents because it can correct for that, but it does for things like this. The scan is surprisingly okay. There are more shadows than I like, and it even completely correct for the perspective on the board, but it's more than adequate. Let me play adding some more light with the external lamp. It's tricky doing that and not adding glare. Okay, that seems better. The scan is overall lighter, but it seems pretty good. Although it's interesting that parts in the center of the image are much crisper than the memory chips at the bottom right corner, which maybe also there was less light in there to start with. So I guess it's not really perfect for scanning boards, but it's definitely doable, as opposed to a flatbed scanner, which is completely not suited to this. Also, as a comparison, I took a picture with my phone thinking that maybe it would be about the same, but no, I was wrong. The one with the scanner is significantly better than the picture taken with my iPhone, so that's good to know. So in the end, the Caesar scanner is really good for scanning books and magazines, but it's no magic bullet. If the books don't open flat easily and they have small margins, it's going to take a lot longer to get good quality scans. But in any case, it's way, way faster than a traditional scanner. I'm bummed that it didn't do a better job scanning the computer board, but it wasn't really designed for that. In any case, I highly recommend it for anyone with retro magazines or books that they want to scan and share. And I will see you next time.